Hello everyone and welcome to this new series of videos where we're going to be building an Elm 0.19 application. The goal of this video series isn't to present to you some perfect Elm code that I've written or show you bit by bit how I build the perfect application. Instead, we're going to build it together in a series of videos. This means what will very commonly happen is some work we did in one video will then return to and edit or update in the next if I've decided we can refactor it more efficiently. And we'll do some live debugging together when I inevitably make mistakes. We'll look up documentation together and we'll generally see what the flow's like if you're building an Elm application from the ground up. I've done a little bit of work to get us off and running, but not much. I've created a server and a little backend for our application. And we're going to be building a blogging application called Distinctly Average if you like a somewhat less good version of medium.com. Over the course of the videos, we'll look at a bunch of different Elm stuff. We're going to see how to do navigation and URLs in the client using Elm. We'll even look at how to test using Elm test. We'll be using some third party packages from the Elm package repository to provide some features for us. And generally, we're just going to see what it's like to deal with an Elm app as it grows, with the compiler helping us out when we make mistakes. So, so far, you can see on the screen, I have this local host uh, server running. This is our front end for our Elm application. There's also a Node.js backend, but we won't talk about that too much for now, but we will look at it when we start allowing the user to edit posts and save posts into the system. The way this app works is that you authenticate via GitHub. We're not going to do our own authentication. I've already set that up just so we don't have to worry about it. But you see here, I can go to localhost 3001 slash auth. This is going to redirect me to GitHub and say that reauthorization is required because I've made an unusually high number of requests. Uh, which is definitely because I've been testing it just before recording this video. So I'm going to say authorize. And eventually it redirects us through to localhost 3001. Notice the URL now. We're on slash sign in and then slash, and then we have the GitHub token. Our job today is going to be saving that GitHub token into our local Elm application because we're going to need this token every time we make a request to our backend. This is how we authenticate the users. At this point, I should note that this video series doesn't require a lot of Elm experience but it does require you to have been familiar with the basics. If you're unsure or if you're not sure if you're quite ready for this, I'd recommend going through the Elmlang guide at guide.elmlang.org. This is a really good introduction to the language. If you do the first half of this or so, which you can probably do in an afternoon or an evening, you'll be pretty set up to come and watch this video. So with that, let's jump straight into our first task. We need to take this token from the URL when we hit the sign in URL and store it into our model so we have that set for the user. I'm going to take the approach I take when I'm building things for real, which is do the kind of hackiest approach to, to get it working. And then in future videos, we'll look at refactoring as well. So if you're watching this and you think, why is he not doing it how, how I would expect him to? It may be that I'm just doing it to get it working, and we'll, we'll return back to that in a bit. So this is the single Elm file we have in our folder so far called main.l. And this is where everything lives right now. Over time, we will split this up into a bunch of files, and you'll see actually how I divide up Elm apps as they grow. But for now, everything is in here. So we're importing the Elm browser module and the navigation module as well, and the HTML and URL modules. We have our type alias model. Currently, I've just set it to be name string. This is just a placeholder that we're going to change. We have all the messages that can flow through our system. And again, so far, I've just got one, which is no op, which stands for no operation. It's just a message that says do nothing. Then in our init function, this is a function that gets called when Elm first runs, and it gets called with any flags. This is data that's been passed into us from the code that initialized our Elm app. We don't have any. You'll notice that the flags alias up here is just an empty record. We also get the current URL, which is going to be really important. We'll see that in a minute. And then we get this navigation key. Elm, Elm nav gives us this when we create an application that has uh, URL support in it. And this is just a way of ensuring that our app has the ability to update the URL, send the user around the place. So when you create an app that has that ability, you get given this key. And this key you need to keep around so that when you want to redirect the user, you can do so. So that key is going to need to go on our model as well. And then in it is supposed to return a model and any commands too. And you can see right now I've just put in a dummy one to get us going. If you've used Elm 0.18, you might be surprised to see the definition for viewers change slightly. It no longer returns HTML of type message when we're building a full Elm app but it returns a document. A document has two parts. It has a title, which will update the title. This means it's really easy to change that as you're on different parts of your app. And the body is now just a list of HTML. So this allows you to have, say, a standard header and a footer across each page and just change the middle section. And you can see right now, I've just got a paragraph with hello world in. Then we have two functions that we won't look at for a little bit, on URL request and on URL change. These get called when the URL changes, when the user makes a request. We will look at these in more detail when we, we need them. And again, in our update function, we're just dealing with the one message we can produce, which is currently a no-op, and we're returning nothing. Then down here, we create our application. So if we go back to the browser, you'll see over here on the right-hand side, if I make the dev tools slightly bigger, 
when we run init on debugging the current URL and we get this big object here, and one of the parts is this path. So what we need to do is take this path and grab the token out of it and put it into our model. So when I'm doing things like this, I first like to start with actually updating the type alias for my model. So let's go in here and we're gonna get rid of name string because we don't need it. And we're gonna see what we do want. We're gonna have a token. And this token we're gonna to have to pass around a lot in our application. And it may or may not be there. So what I'm gonna say is that the token is maybe a type of token and that type we're about to create. I'm gonna say type token can be a token with a string attached to it. This looks a bit strange, it's a lot of the word token, but the, the alternative here would be say type alias token equals string. This would work, but then anywhere where we say we're taking in a token, we're actually, we can just pass in a string and the Elm compiler will let us. By wrapping it in this opaque type, what happens is we construct a token by giving it the string, which is the token, then anywhere that accepts the token can take this and we'll know that we are giving it the actual token from GitHub rather than any string. This will become more obvious when we start using it in the next uh, video, but for now that, that's how we're gonna model it. And we set it to be a maybe because it may or may not be there. While I'm here, the other thing we're gonna need to do is store this key here. When we get given this, we need to store it. It's gonna help us push the user around the application and update URLs. So we're gonna say navigation key is gonna be a type key. So you see here now in our init, we're getting errors because we're not returning the right stuff. So I'm just gonna say let new model equals, and the token for now, we're gonna set it to nothing and we're about to do the work to change that. And then we're going to need the key as well. And I've set it as navigation key, which equals key. And then in this return here, I just need to return the new model and command.none. So now let's start actually passing the URL out and pulling in the bit we need. And so for now, I'm just going to write the code in here. It's a series of steps in a let, and we'll refactor it. So we know the path is at url.path, and we're going to pull out the parts by splitting that. So we'll say parts equals uh, string.split. And this takes the thing you want to split on, which is uh, slash for us, and then the url.path. And let's again, let's log this out. So we'll say debug.log uh, parts, and we'll wrap all that. Let's go and see what we have there. You can see here now our parts is uh, an empty string at the start, then sign in, and then this big uh, token, which is the one we want. So we want the last thing in the uh, list that we've been given back. If you're watching this and thinking the Elm navigation library has uh, string and URL parsing built in, you'd be right. This is just the most basic way to get it up and running and we'll refactor to that in a later video. I didn't want to start by diving right into the nitty gritty of the navigation library. So to get the first thing out of here, what we can do is we can take these parts and we can say first part is gonna be list.reverse parts and that's gonna pull it around the other way so our token is at the beginning. And then from there we can say uh, list.head. So we're gonna take the parts and then pull the first thing off. I'm actually gonna rename first part here to token. So now you might be thinking we can say token equals token, but that's not quite right and you'll see there's an error. Let's go and look in the console and we'll see it in a bit more detail. So you can see here that something is off with the body of the init function. The body is a tuple of type navigation key and token being maybe string, but it should be a model where the token is a maybe token instead. So let's go and look at how we can fix that. So what we have here is list reverse parts list.head will either give us nothing or it will give us a string that we're gonna assume is the token. If it's nothing, we just wanna leave it as nothing. If it's something, we need to wrap it in a token. So we could say case uh, this of, and if it's nothing, that's fine, we'll return nothing. If it's just the lower string token, which I'll call toc, then we want to actually wrap it in our token type. And I can say uh, token, or actually rather, I still want this to be a maybe, so I'll say just, uh, token talk. And now you'll see that all our errors have gone away. The app is compiling again. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to log the token out here. So we're going to say underscore equals debug.log token token. This underscore trick is very useful, by the way. In a let block, you can assign anything to underscore when you just don't care about it. So if you've got lots of things you want to debug, this is a really handy way to do that. So you see here now we have the token. It's just the token. And this means we're able to now store this onto the model. This implementation isn't perfect. There's a couple of bugs, but we're going to leave that and sort that in the next video. This was just the kind of introduction video to get us up and running. However, there's one way we can improve how we set the token. When you've got something that's a maybe, which is what this list reverse list head is, and you want to change the value that's inside the maybe, but only if it exists, which is what we're doing here. If it's a nothing, we leave it as nothing. If it's just something, we keep it in a just, but we transform it, in this case, by wrapping it in our own type. 
Elm provides a function called maybe.map that will do this for us. So we can say token equals maybe.map and it's going to take two arguments. The first is the function that will transform the value inside the maybe. And for us that's just token because we want to take the string that's inside the maybe and wrap it in a token. And then it takes the thing that to apply that to. So we can say reverse parts uh, list.head. And this is exactly the same as that big case statement we just had, but a bit more concise. So I'm just going to tidy this up a bit. We're going to get rid of that logging there. We're going to make parts just be this string, and we're going to get rid of this logging too. And now let's see if we can write this as one big pipeline to make it a little bit tidier for now. So we're going to say url.path, and we'll do string.split on quotes. And there we want to do list.reverse. And then we want to take the first thing from it, list.head. And then we want to map it. So we'll say maybe.map over token. So I'm going to let uh, token equals this. And we can get rid of all of this now. Hit save. And hopefully, let's go and check I still uh, have that all working correctly. So let's quickly log down here, underscore equals debug.log new model. And you can see there that we have navigation key equals function. That's fine, that's just a uh, Elm navigation detail, we don't need to worry about that. And the token is still just the token as we expect. In the next video, we'll actually see a much better way to do this using the navigation package in Elm. This video is just to get us up and running, get you familiar with the, the app and this, this style of video. And we'll do some refactoring in the next video to use the navigation package to pass out these routes much more effectively.